This series is supported by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. The high-quality, fresh ingredients are sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm to you in under a week, contact-free, of course. I've been highly recommended to use HelloFresh by a member of our team, who swears by not only the quality, but the efficiency of using their service. With their easy-to-follow recipe cards with step-by-step instructions and ingredients in just the right proportions, it takes the hassle out of grocery shopping and trying to think of what to cook. Go to hellofresh.com slash hand14 and use the code hand14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash hand14. The invisible hand contains sensitive material that could threaten the safety of our contributors. To protect the identities of those involved, we will mostly be using first names or pseudonyms. Content warning. This series contains graphic audio relating to animal cruelty and some violent themes, which may be distressing to some listeners. These episodes were written to be listened to chronologically. This is Chapter 2. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. Another thing we are taught in school is history. Being educated in Australia, this meant lessons on Captain Cook's discovery of the land on which we stood. Only later was that understanding revised. I was standing on the land of the Gadigal clan of the Aora Nation. The land was stolen, not ceded, and never given back. And just like that, the reality of the present tense was changed. History then became not an insight into truth, but a story. With all its foibles, creative license and narrator bias, a story told about the past that shapes an understanding of the present. A story unfinished. And for unpublished authors, a story untold. This is Georgina Savage, and you're listening to The Invisible Hand. Chapter 2. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. Uh, my name is Wilson Sewell. Uh, I'm working here at the uh, Crocodile Bridge section, uh, and I've been in the Kruger from 1986 until now. Sergeant Wilson Sewell is a member of the Crocodile Bridge team. He holds the most senior position below Section Ranger. He was actually leading the patrol on the ground in the previous chapter of this story, but we didn't meet him then. Yes, I joined the Kruger National Park as a general worker at Lower Sabi, where you come from now. As a general worker in that time, Sergeant Sweller was tasked with park maintenance, such as cleaning, fencing and property upkeep. Yeah, by that time, Kruger National Park was was very good because there were no big challenges that at that time like this that we're facing nowadays because even the rhino poaching that time was not there it was nice when you would see the rangers were you hoping like one day i want to be a ranger no i was not thinking i would be a ranger by that time i didn't see an opportunity to me to be a ranger because i thought maybe you have to be special to, to get this job of a field ranger. And you didn't think that you were special? <laughs> no, I was not thinking like that. I remember in 1989, the section ranger asked me that, I, do you want to be a field ranger? And I just said to him, yes. And he said, do you know how to do it? And I said, no, I'm expecting you to teach me. And then he said, tomorrow, come to my office and then we'll make a plan. How did you feel about that? Were you excited? I was very excited. I joined St. Parks. My father was working there at Loa Sabi, the rest camp. So I went to my father and uh, 
tell him that uh, the section ranger say that he want me to be a field ranger and uh, even my father was very excited about that he was very proud of you in that moment yes and so how how was the job for you did you love it did you love being out in the bush and yeah in lower sabi i think this thing is like it's, it's natural to me because before when i was at school when i was a kid uh, I like to go fishing, I like to do stuff in the bush. Even my father was teaching me like to go to the bush, something like that. So when I, I, I joined the organization, I feel like um, even here in the Kuruga National Park is, is the same as, as the thing that I was doing when I was a kid. I grew up in Komatipot. Komatipot is not far. It's a town here outside, it's eight kilometers. So it's it's right on the edge of the park. Essentially, it's one of the bordering communities of the park. So when you were younger, did you ever come to the Kruger? Was it part of your childhood? No, I didn't come. The first time I saw, I saw the animal, that is when I joined the Kruger, 1986. Wow, really? Did you? I was not coming. I was not coming to the Kruger. I used to see animals on the books and stuff like that. Well, I think it's safe to say that, you know, the communities, and until fairly recently, the last 20 years or so, have seen it as sort of a white man's domain playground, as it were, that they had no part of. This is Ken Maggs, the head ranger of the Kruger. And why was that? Well, simply, they weren't allowed into the park in that sense. The Kruger National Park, as it's known today, has a complex racial history. This history provides a context and a precedent for the way it operates today. There's very little public discourse about this racial history. Okay, so my name is Annette Hübschler and I'm a sociologist and criminologist at the University of Cape Town. I've been working on illegal wildlife trade issues, general policing issues, climate change, resilience, general organised crime issues um, in sub-Saharan Africa. I chatted to Dr. Annette Hübschler as I wanted to get an idea of the history of the Kruger to make sense of what's going on there now. If you go into the history of um, Kruger National Park, it's very interesting. There's a very famous South African historian, Jane Carruthers, who's written a book on on the history of um, the Kruger National Park. And she talks about the history of um, Kruger National Park being tied to identity building for white South Africans. The Kruger National Park came into being in 1926. And it was interesting because somehow um, Paul Kruger was sort of elevated to hero status as, as the, you know, sort of the driving force behind this park. And so there's, there's a lot about white South African identity that is tied to these parks. And during apartheid times, there was sort of a double exclusion of local people, local black people from the parks anyways. So they couldn't go into parks. At some stage, there was a tented camp in Kruger National Park, by Lula Camp, where black people could go and camp if they wanted to go and um, look at animals. But it's it was absolutely, it was sort of a temple of privilege, if you will, where people, white people would go for holidays and yeah it's the demographics are slowly changing but I mean it's not like local communities from uh, staying next to Kruger National Park can afford to go in. I mean if you go into the major conservation areas in South Africa most of them are unaffordable to locals so you know just getting into the park the entrance fee is way too much for anybody to 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 afford and you need a car to drive around. Most people don't have a car. You need to have accommodation, all sorts of things. You need to have leave. At face value, the Kruger embodies a virtuous cause, a place of education, abundance and harmony. However, from its genesis to the current day, the spectre of racism was and is ever present. Any genuine accounting of its history must include the good and the ill, always and especially when one obfuscates the other. The forerunner to the Kruger was the Sabi Reserve, 
one third of the modern park's southern tip, proclaimed a protected area in 1898. The discriminatory policies began soon after. In the early 1900s, white colonial administrators had impeded African hunting, restricting their access to dogs and sounding alarms through official inquiries that stated they were decimating game. The opposite was true, with the overly protective policies leading to the destruction of African crops. The true motive was to prevent subsistence hunting and to force the otherwise autonomous African inhabitants into the labour market, which white society could utilise. When the Sabi Game Reserve was re-proclaimed in 1902, all resident Africans were to be evicted, and by August the following year between two to three thousand had been. In May 1905, it was decided that those Africans remaining in the reserve, deemed squatters, were tenants on crown land and thus owed rent, paid in cash or labour. They were also prohibited from carrying firearms, and when an application by a chieftain to grant messengers the right to carry assegais, spears, was submitted, it was struck down by the reserve's white warden, James Stevenson Hamilton. The warden ensured his borders were extensively patrolled, arresting and punishing Africans as poachers. These exclusionary and debilitating policies unsurprisingly brewed resentment in Africans towards the game reserve, fast becoming a white man's playground. This sentiment was made to linger through decades of policy. Soon after the proclamation of the Kruger National Park in 1926, tourism was encouraged for whites and distinctly discouraged for blacks. By the 1950s, such segregation by inference was replaced with the explicitly racist regime of apartheid, invoked to evict the remaining African population. It was only at the end of the 1980s that segregation at the park was abolished. Despite the removal of formal policy, social, historic, economic and racial barriers remain. By 2003, black South Africans accounted for only 4% of the visitors to sand parks, rising to approximately 25% in 2015. On the surface, Kruger National Park is a wildlife wonderland. From the Lobombo Mountains to the Oliphant River, place names in Zulu and Afrikaans exist in seeming harmony, belying the encroachment one foisted upon the other. My name is Jacob Zamini. I'm an assistant professor of African history at Princeton University. I work on contemporary history. I focus on the environmental history of Africa. I focus on the political history of South Africa. Uh, and for the purposes of this conversation, I also study uh, national parks, both in the African context, but also in a comparative uh, global context. This is Jacob Zamini. Assistant Professor of African History at Princeton University. So my first question is, you published a book titled Safari Nation, A Social History of the Kruger National Park. Could you give our listeners some insight into what you mean by a social history and a summary of what the social history of the Kruger actually is? A basic definition of what social history is, it's a history from below. So it's a history taken from the perspective of uh, you know, people on the ground, as it were. Uh, so it's not a political history in the sense that it doesn't privilege uh, what happens on the corridors of power, uh, but what it does privilege 
is the lived experience uh, you know, of people on the ground. It's history from the perspective of ordinary people. Uh, it's history that shifts the focus away from elites, uh, that shifts the focus away from you know, power to uh, something that we might call lived experience. And in the case of the Kruger Park, my interest is in ordinary people and their engagement uh, you know, with the park uh, over time. And what do you mean by the term Safari Nation? Safari Nation, uh, the title, is designed to capture what is, for me, a key feature of the black history of the park, as I call it, but also a key feature of Southern African history. And, and that feature is mobility. What has animated South African history is precisely struggles over movement. One group of people wanting to move uh, and another uh, trying to limit that ability to move uh, you know, for all kinds of reasons, you know, either because, uh, you know, the colonial state, the apartheid state needed black labor or because, uh, you know, black folks wanted to move, you know, for better prospects, for better jobs or to get away from, you know, the prying eyes uh, of the colonial or the apartheid states. You know, the Kruger National Park is the size of the state of New Jersey, a pretty massive place. And what defines that territory that constitutes the Kruger is not just a movement of animals in and through and between, you know, what are now nation states, but also the movement of people uh, back and forth. Let's not forget the Kruger Park is an important corridor and has been historically for the movement of people from southeastern Africa. So what's today Mozambique to the mines of South Africa. We have tended, uh, and by this, by we, I mean, you know, historians and scholars, uh, you know, who bother to look at the history of the park, mm. we've tended to privilege, you know, white supremacist notions uh, of what, uh, you know, people of color could and could not do. Uh, I mean, you'll see in the literature stated as, a, as an article of faith that, you know, under apartheid, people, black people couldn't go to the park, which is simply not true. Uh, they could go to the park, but it doesn't mean that the experience of the park was uniform within the black, uh, you know, communities themselves. Uh, but it also doesn't mean that uh, the experience of the park was, uh, you know, similar to what the experience of white people going to the park would have been. So that's what gets neglected. And the trouble with this is that we then take from this, uh, this assumption that black people couldn't go into the park, the wrong lesson, and, and that's that, well, you know, black people have no interest in nature, black people have no interest in conservation, and black people have no interest in the park itself, uh, which is simply not true. What the approach does end up doing, unfortunately, is to, in some ways, make a uniform the black experience of the park and to treat every black person as if they, you know, every black person was a victim of apartheid that was a victim of colonial rule before apartheid, and that they were victims in the same way. And of course, the trouble with this is that it obscures the significant differences within the black community right, under colonial rule, under apartheid. It obscures the uh, profound gender differences right, mm. in how people could and could not relate to the park. Uh, so, so that's one you know, unintended effect. The erasure of black people from the park or the erasure of the black experience broadly defined from the park and its history is that it actually ends up serving the purpose for right-wing scholars providing evidence that you see they're not as advanced mm. as we are because they haven't developed the <laughs> acumen needed yeah. to appreciate nature on its own terms. So that's why they will post the rhino because for them the rhino has no aesthetic appeal, has no aesthetic value. Right? Mm -hmm. It's just meat. Uh, yeah. with, uh, you know, an expensive horn attached yeah. to its head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so that's the danger. Did you fall in love with animals when you got the job here and the wild animals and um, rhinos and things like that? Did you start to feel a lot for animals? Yeah, that's true. Because even now we are fighting this story of rhino poaching. If I find a carcass of a rhino, to me it's, it's, it's painful. If I'm thinking of that animal lying down like that just for the horn, it's painful to me. Here's Sergeant Suella again. And do you have any empathy for the poachers? Do you think about where, they, where they're from and why they're doing it? Yeah, we, we know exactly where they're from. I feel for them. If they come to poach animals, it's dangerous here because now we, we, we are trained like soldiers. 
But those syndicates, those big people that they're giving them money, they recruit them to come here for peanuts. They're not giving them a lot of money. Even our children now, I'm working here now. I have my children outside. I know that one day maybe I'll, I'll, I'll fight with, with my own child. Outside in my community, straight where I'm staying, I know that there are children that are coming here to poach. And those people that are sending them, they're not coming. They are staying outside in the hotels. They're driving good cars and stuff. They're not coming. So at the end of the day, the people that are in danger are those young people that are coming to, 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 to Kruger to poach. But they, at the end of the day, they get peanuts for that. And so does that make you feel conflicted with what you have to do with your job in terms of if they are going for you, you have to be able to fight back, but knowing that they are children from your communities? There's nothing that I can do because if... As that one is my job. If I go outside, patrolling, find tracks, I know that these people, they're coming to, to kill animals the place where I'm also getting paid to look after my children. The very same children that I'm talking about that they recruited them to come to poach here. So it's, it's like, it's 50-50 because every morning when I wake up, I'm going to work. I know that at the end of the, 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 the day, I'll get paid. And then that money that I'm getting, I want to support my children. I want to look after my children. Foster and Calvin, two of Greg's Lower Sabi Rangers, are here on duty. Calvin is one of the dog handlers, and he's been working here for a long time. Foster is new, only a year or two into his position. There is a monthly or fortnightly roster, which posts two rangers to a remote camping location tasked with looking out for poachers. Okay, thank you. Hello. Thanks so much. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Hello, how are you? Fine with you. I'm good. Okay. This mostly entails listening for gunshots while patrolling the area. The conditions are not comfortable. They work tirelessly in the heat and humidity and with the looming threat of both predatory animals and poachers. Oh, I got I got you guys a present. Thank you. <laughs> there you Thank go. You. Can, can of Coke. Okay, can I? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Little solace can be taken in their starkly basic camp setup, in what feels like the middle of nowhere, deep in the South African bush. There's barely any reception out here. Here at the camp which is hidden by a cage of broken branches, leaves and camouflage netting. There's a couple of large tents, a cooker, two chairs, a can of mozzie spray. It's full moon tonight, a dreaded time for rangers. The night sky is so bright, the poachers can see everything. Conservationists call it death moon. Like, we have to keep quite quiet, don't we? Yes, uh, we just have to have our voices uh, very low because now it is uh, that time where they can shoot. So we do our observation post uh, from this time. You have to remind me to talk quiet because sometimes I go, oh. <laughs> it's around 6 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock now. The sun's kind of about to set. It's quite cloudy, but it's also very full moon at the moment, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. How long have you been here for? We were here from Tuesday afternoon. Today is the, it's the eighth Saturday. So we're here for, now it's for how many days? Four days or three, yeah. What is it like being out together for a week in the middle of nowhere with no one else around you and you have to keep very quiet the whole time? 
Uh, sometimes get very lonely, but we get along uh, very well together. So, yes, we chat a lot, we sleep, we eat a lot, and <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, the Kamanet is um, to camouflage this area. So, when you come from uh, all the angles, it is not quite easy to see this camp. So, somebody can just pop in here without noticing uh, that there's a camp or something. Yeah. <laughs> And so what do you both, what do you guys think about poachers? Do you feel that they are particularly bad people or do you feel that they are maybe good people that have got into a bad situation because of need? Uh, <laughs> Uh, to him, these people, they just want money. That's what you can say about the poachers. Mm. What, about, what about you? Uh, to myself, I just think the poachers are just ordinary people who are being used. The uh, people who like gain through them. They have promised them a lot of money or maybe they are intimidating them. They just come here and push. So the bosses, they don't worry about them. Even if they get killed, they will go and recruit other people. So that's what I think about the poachers. The people who come here, I think they're just innocent people. And so when, when um, a poacher dies because of conservation, does that make you... How does that make you feel? I feel very bad because I know that they are innocent. Because you might find that the person with the gun is the one who knows everything. And then the rest, they don't know everything. So whenever there's contact, anything can happen. Yeah. And where are both of you from? I'm from Shubukani. It's just around here. So just outside the park? Yes, uh, just outside the park. And then Slangoka Biwale... Yes, Giani. Yeah, it's just adjacent to Kruger National Park, but on the northern side of Kruger National Park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so do both of you come from towns where people have become poachers? Yes. Um, in my community, there were a lot of poachers. Yeah, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that way, you know better than anyone that there's some people that can choose one life and some people that can choose another life. And you, you both have chosen the life to do conservation, but then there's someone from the same community that's chosen to be on the other side and essentially you're both sent to fight each other. Yes, um, that uh, becomes a very big problem to us because like now... I sometimes think like this was not supposed to happen because at the end of the day, the rhinos which you are protecting or the rhinos horn which they are selling, it doesn't have any use to us, but we are fighting for this thing for other people. So I'm protecting something which doesn't belong to me. And then again, he wants something which he cannot use. He's just going to give it to other people. So. What we are fighting for, it is both not us. What are we fighting for, Foster says. It's both not ours. What I think Foster is getting at is that for him, it feels like they are fighting a bloody battle over something, a species, that does not belong to either side of the conflict. Which leaves me wondering, if all this infrastructure is built around an animal to protect it, do those who own the infrastructure own the animal? And who owns the infrastructure? I begin to wonder if this conflict is a classic case of rich man's war, poor man's fight. So how does it feel for you guys when you have to go back into your communities? How are you received by people? Are you received as heroes? Are you received as villains? Hey, <laughs> Those people, they even wish to kill us when we are at home because we are busy protecting them from getting what uh, they want. 
So he's saying even if you can, I can go to Hazelview Town wearing this uniform, I might not come back here alive. So. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. I don't even like going out driving the uh, Kruger National Park vehicle. So whenever I go out with the Kruger National Park vehicle, I have to be fast. I go into town and come back very quickly without being noticed. Maybe if that's possible. <laughs> I'm so I'm I'm like I don't know why I'm shocked. This makes a lot of sense to me, but for some reason I'm like, why? Why do you do it then? Like since I was at um, environmental education, I was busy teaching environmental education for five years, and then I decided like let me change course. I have spoken a lot about. Uh, conserving nature and then now let me do this maybe i will just have contributed towards saving rhinos so that's the reason i'm doing it i'm not planning to do this for the rest of my life but maybe for the next five three years and then i will be happy so if he quits uh, doing this job uh, it might happen that um, these animals or the big five uh, is going to extinct and then the younger generation they might not be uh, able to see this so that's why this thing is protecting it for the future generation and why do you think that there's some people that care so much about that and the animals not becoming extinct and being available for the next generation and other people who are uh, don't care about that from the same communities? Uh, I think like we come from different families. The way we are brought up, I think it is the one which uh, contributes to our thinking towards nature. My love for nature began while I was very young. I was brought here to Kruger National Park, see animals, and then I loved animals. So I think for the person who have never been into Kruger National Park, you will have uh, different thoughts uh, about animals or natural resources. Can you guys tell me why, if there's communities that are so close and they're on the border of the Kruger, why have a lot of people from the communities not been able to have a relationship with animals? People were forcefully removed from Kruger National Park and then they have to find their, a place to stay outside Kruger National Park and then that they cannot access um, these uh, natural resources or animals. I think it is the one which uh, brought anger to them. They used to hunt back then, but now they cannot. Even if it's for subsistence, um, they cannot do that. I think that's another thing, because now if you want to hunt, they'll say you have to have a permit. So the permit is for people who have got money. And then for myself, because I don't have money, it means I cannot hunt. So I think um, the hate came from it. And then that's the differences that we have. For people who are being taught about the importance of these natural resources or this wildlife, who know the importance of it. But for somebody who is not being taught about it, they don't care at all. So even if now we talk about rhino poaching, it is nothing to them. It doesn't bother them at all. So. Conservationists who are from the local communities bordering the park, where poachers are also recruited from, are put in a confronting position where, in order to achieve their aims, to both preserve honour in their roles and obtain the necessary resources for their survival, they may need to kill people from their own community who are poaching based on the same two drivers. And there was, a, and, and in some cases, still a disjoint between what we're doing as a conservation organisation and what's happening in the communities. There's perceptions, the grass is greener on the other side of that fence, and, and why is that? And why are all these white tourists coming and why are there so many cars? And a lot of money being spent, you know, by white tourists overseas and local. And, and what benefit are, are they deriving from all of this? And so it was always uh, them and us. And, and to a degree, it still is like that. You know, we still need to do a lot more work in the communities. A lot of work has been done, a lot of really good work, but a lot more must be done. This is Ken again. 
the head ranger. This park is a community park. It belongs to the community as much as it belongs to me. The community on our boundaries need to see the benefits of the Kruger. What benefits we can provide the immediate communities. The only problem, of course, and challenge is, so where does that stop? Our expertise in, in the park, I talk now from our technical services, our administrative services, the ranger corps, our conservation department. The knowledge that is embedded there is we should be sharing, particularly the conservation aspects of it, you know, so that we promote the conservation ethics into the communities. We can be doing a lot more of that. And then, then of course, it's the educational side of the park, you know, making sure that we have a continuous flow of children coming through so that we can impact them and while they're impressionable like this, make sure that they're being exposed to conservation and what it's all about. Well, exactly. Just on that point, like a lot of the people, the white people I've spoken to and why they have such a strong love for the Kruger, um, they often talk about their childhood and coming here with their grandparents or parents and spending time camping and this sort of thing. But I haven't heard that from any black people or people of colour that they got to spend much time here as children. And I'm wondering whether the, the attachment to the animals and the connection with the animals has a lot more to do with the lack of access to them. Oh, that is true. And is that because it was actually illegal for people of colour to be in the park during apartheid? Well, at one time, yes, absolutely. And so how can you expect someone that doesn't have access to understand it? To understand the racial history of the Kruger, we must look at the racial history of South Africa, a history that has been showcased on a global stage. Between 200,000 and 100,000 years ago, modern humans began to evolve throughout Africa, including South Africa. They became the San, who later met up with the southbound Khoi pastoralists from the north and became known collectively as the Khoi San. The ancient African kingdom, Mapungumwe Hill, was established between 900 and 1300 AD and was home to a powerful tribe that flourished on trading with Eastern cultures. In 1652, Jan van Riebeck and his 90-strong party arrived from the Netherlands and set up a ship refuelling station at Cape Town, an important stop both geographically and politically, as it was on the only early trade route from Europe and the Americas to India, the Spice Islands of the East Indies, and the East. Over the next 200 years, various waves of other European and Indian settlers also arrived. Subsequently, the Dutch, British, and to an extent, the French, fought for the control of the Cape, with the British finally triumphant in 1806. Also, the late 1800s saw the discovery of South Africa's immense gold and diamond wealth, and later, the Great Platinum Finds. The 20th century saw the end of the South African War, also known as the Second Anglo-Boer War, which was fought from 1899 to 1902. The establishment of the Union of South Africa in 1910, a narrow victory for the Africana National Party in 1948, and in the years to come, the formulation of apartheid. Apartheid, which translates to separateness, was a nearly 50-year period of institutionalised racism and the suppression of non-whites, during which the African National Congress was banned and its leaders, including Nelson Mandela, banished to prison on Robben Island. The unbanning of the ANC, the release of Mandela and his fellow prisoners, and the 1994 democratic elections heralded the birth of the new South Africa. Since 1992, when the referendum was passed to end the apartheid regime, at least constitutionally, there has been an ongoing and often unofficial process of reconciliation. 
integration has not been linear. People are resistant to change and divisive attitudes of domination are ingrained. The Talking Point with Bongi Kuala, 9am to midday. The past is still raw. So let's go back to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Forgiveness and reconciliation was at the heart of the TRC, right? The truth was the cornerstone of this exercise. The oppressed, the hurt, the brutalized, the harassed, whose family members were maimed and killed, were put through the TRC and they were expected through tears to publicly express forgiveness uh, for their terrorizers. But how much truth came out of the TRC? And, and accountability, of course, because forgiveness, yes, we got that, which is why people are not in jail in numbers for their atrocities. But how much truth did we get from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Hearing this clip from SAFM's The Talking Point, it's clear to me that many think the apartheid transition was handled poorly by the state and thus has only been haphazardly successful. The Kruger is a microcosm within the macrocosm of the South African situation. History then became not an insight into truth, but a story with all its foibles, creative license and narrator bias. A story told about the past that shapes an understanding of the present. A story unfinished. And for those who've written themselves as the protagonists, a story that serves to maintain the silence of the oppressed. Chinua Achebe, who was an Igbo Nigerian poet and critic, considered by many to be the grandfather of African literature, said, Until lions have their own historians, yeah. the yeah. story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. That's Wando Achebe, Chinua's daughter, who, in keeping with family tradition, is a world-renowned historian. That was good. That was good, but you're speeding up a bit and um, just do it again. Take, do the breaths in between. And that's Sophie Side, directing me in the studio and also talking to Professor Nwando Achebe. Sophie Side is the co-creator of this show and wrote most of the narration you're hearing me perform. Narration that's currently being recorded in Pirate Studios in Dalston, London. That's the funny thing about representing reality through documentary. It's often more fictionalised than it seems. This can make the ethics tricky, but more on that later. For now, all you need to know is that Sophie interviewed all the academics that feature throughout this series, so you'll hear her ask questions occasionally. Good morning. Good <laughs> My morning. name is Wando Achebe. And I am the Jack and Margaret Sweet Endowed Professor of History at Michigan State University. I am a specialist in oral history, African oral history, West Africanist by training, and I work on women, gender, and sexuality issues. So for me, in simple, and I like to call, I like to say simple Eurocentric terms, right? Yeah. History is the study of the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the simplest way that we can break it down. This mm -hmm. past is essentially a study of the past events of human beings. As an organized field of specialization, the study of history encompasses memory, it encompasses discovery, collection, organization, presentation, the interpretation of information, which we as historians call historical evidence about mm. all of these past human events. Africans view history as a continuum, a continuum consisting of the past, the yeah. present, and the future. But all of these events are linked together. History and culture are inextricably yeah. connected, right? Thus, there cannot be any culture without history, mm -hmm. nor can there be history without culture in my mind. In my mind, every significant political phenomenon lives in history. Politics is shaped by the events that happened in the past. And I'll give you some examples. For instance, yeah. if you look at the African continent, yeah. 
There could not be indirect rule, for instance, without the forceful takeover of African territories by the British, who then had to grapple with ways to rule those territories effectively. There could be no apartheid without the forceful settlement of a Southern African territory by the Dutch than the British, who needed to prove that they were occupying vacant, and I put that in quotes, yeah. vacant yeah. land, yeah. right? And therefore, they created false histories of Africans that they found there. You know, you're talking about over four and a half centuries of European writing about Africa, right? Yes. And this writing has produced a history of Africa, right? Which does not truly describe Africa, but in actuality, this writing describes European response to Africa. In a TED Talk, which has been viewed 7.3 million times on YouTube, writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie talks about the danger of a single story. A single story being a narrative which dominates, creating a version of reality that is skewed and one-dimensional. These dominant narratives are often told by the voices of those who belong to dominant groups and eclipse those with less powerful voices. James Baldwin said, people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. Here in the Kruger, I feel as if I'm observing history unfurling in real time, where a complicated war seems to have no end in sight. I wanted to know what Sergeant Suella thought about this. Do you ever think that this war will end? The way the things is happening, it's difficult to, to say we'll finish, we'll end this war, because all over the world, hearing the talking about the name corruption. That is where I doubt that we will end this war. Because sometimes you will be thinking that you are fighting this war, people are coming from outside. But sometimes you find that people are here. Even if you're giving the plan for the day, they're looking at you. They're taking what you, you, you're saying and then they call the poachers outside and tell them that what is our plan today. And how does it make you feel knowing that within the organisation and everything that you're doing, putting your life on the line and there's people within your ranks and within the organisation that are working against you? It's very bad. They want money. I, I used to say to people that the story of money you, you will not say money is enough. Even those big people that they have, they are billionaires and stuff, they still want money on top of that billions that they have. It's, it's difficult to tell the story about it. The story of money. In South Africa, I hear a lot of people refer to concepts or social realities as stories, which makes sense to me, or makes it simple at least. But the story of money is not straightforward. Not really. Yeah, in my view, it's, as rangers, we don't earn much. But we earn enough. This is Greg again. We're here for a cause. The most disappointing thing about it is we're not doing it for the money. We're doing it for the, for the love and the life of it. There's a reason we're here, you know. And so when we have corruption within our own ranks, it, I think it hurts, you know, doubly hard. It really does. It's not good. <laughs> it's not good. Oh my gosh, hyenas on the road. Sorry, guys. But I guess there's so many reasons why people are dishonest. So many reasons. And it could be you know, their nature to be honest and take a, take a quick buck and take the shortcuts in life where, whenever they can or perhaps others are coerced into it, you know, pressured into it through 
blackmail or, or threats or you know but who knows we're fighting a an honorable and noble cause and then and I think that's what makes it so bad yeah when people are corrupt and become criminals and take advantage of them I asked Ratia, the clinical psychologist we heard from in the previous chapter, about her thoughts on this. Many of them didn't choose to do this job because of the the level of unemployment, 29% unemployment in the country. I do not believe that each field ranger here is passionate about his job. Some of them are very passionate and I hope to think that most of them are, but there are those ones who have admitted that that's the only job they could find and they were lucky enough to live in the surrounding areas because they're from the community, they are then employed. But when they are not passionate about animals as well, you do find that they develop problems because they have families to care for and very often they have extended families to care for. And in a lot of cases, they're the only breadwinners. But I think there are some of them who are under a lot of pressure to provide for extended families. And that makes them quite vulnerable to be turned and to cooperate with poaching syndicates. Any type of criminal behavior where a person's conscience seems to get overridden by other rationalizations and their conscience actually starts diminishing and you see that in other aspects of their behavior as well. I can't even imagine the psychological kind of impact of living a double life and um, constantly ignoring your conscience to the point that it erodes. But also, I can't imagine the psychological impact of knowing that there are people within your team that are against you in such a kind of tiring war. Do you notice the enemy within the ranks has an effect on people? Yes, it does have an effect on people. I find that those who become involved with poaching, uh, as you rightfully said, that it, it brings a lot of stress because they, they live within a team in living quarters. They have to hide what they're doing. The individual who's involved then becomes extremely anxious. And that to me is a red flag if a ranger is referred to me for anxiety or depression or oppositional behaviour. As we saw earlier in the chapter, rangers that have family ties in the same communities as poachers are often put in difficult positions straddling two opposing worlds. These guys are often the target of pressure from the syndicates to give up information. Even without the specific pressures of alliance, part of the work of all rangers, regardless of where they are from, and given the hefty financial benefit of doing so, is resisting the temptation to collude. This temptation may become especially difficult to ignore if you're struggling to make ends meet, or worse, someone with power has you in a bind. The other problem that we have is that rhino money you know, is developing the communities. People are building houses, shops, factories through rhino money. So that money is going into the community and there's development, but illegal development. So you get this Robin Hood effect, you know, where the poachers are looked up to simply because they're actually taking the place of the government in terms of delivery. Young kids are looking up to poachers because they drive three cars, jewellery, lots of women. And so this is an incentive for them to go down that road. Yeah, this is a pathway to um, a level of financial pride that they have never seen in other role models from non-illegal means. No, it's very sad. I mean, the amount of money being ploughed into the communities through illegal gain 
is frightening. And addictive. It will be addictive. And then it's very difficult for the community not to turn a blind eye in terms of their collusion, the community members in the syndicate. And do you think that that might have some relationship to why there might be corruption or collusion from within your own ranks in the park? Yeah, quite often it is. You know, it's very difficult for us to get to grips with that collusion and corruption. And, and so the honest people, honest colleagues say, well, oh, you know, if you, you can't get on top of it, then why am I being silly here? Why am I being stupid? My colleagues are corrupted. I, I might as well join them. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is intimidation. You know, we don't understand fully the intimidation that takes place with our colleagues in the communities. We don't. Our rangers out here, you know, they're not aliens. They don't come from another planet and we've put them here and they carry out the job. They are community members and they come from the communities and have to go back to the communities. So that, that becomes a big issue. Foster and Calvin have invited me for beers at the Lower Sabi staff living quarters. This is a camp set up for employees. Some of them are rangers. Others hold positions that relate to tourism, like working the reception, the restaurant, the gas station. Remember, there's an aspect of the Kruger that feels undomesticated, wild, like the rural regions that Foster and Calvin were patrolling days earlier and another that feels more like a family campground or a caravan park. That's what it feels like here in the living quarters. We crack a beer. And so what's the kind of setup? Is there like a hierarchy? Is there a rule of who gets what house? The house are being allocated like according to the service. So if you have uh, saved uh, many years working in Kruger Park, so you are considered to get uh, a big house. This is Foster again. Would you consider this your home or no, not at all? For myself, I don't like to consider it my home <laughs> because yes, I've got family. We live like um, a very big uh, family. Uh, is uh, we consider each other friends. Hey, uh, Prince, how are you? Good and you. <laughs> Good. Do you remember me? Yes, I do. <laughs> do you want to tell the people at home who you are? People listening? Oh, okay, okay, okay. No, I'm Prince. <laughs> Prince is another one of the Lower Sabi Rangers. He's loud and confident. I'm trying to figure out how what life is like here. No. When I'm with these guys, a life high. It's perfect, nice. Yeah, I'm having fun with them. Here, the living quarters, and there, the bushes. Yeah, we treat each other like brothers. Yeah. There's definitely a sense of camaraderie between the guys, not dissimilar to a military platoon. They live in the staff village in close quarters, eating together, drinking together, celebrating the wins and feeling the losses as a unit. Their work schedule is 21 days on, five days off a month. They usually take those days at once to visit their families in the bordering communities. They rise early and rest late. This is a tough job. It's not an easy job because you must always be ready. You know? Like sometimes uh, the section ranger can call you at four in the morning. And you have to report at work by that time, so any time. Yes, you can go to work. Do you like your job? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Do you? Prince? Yeah, boo. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it a lot, yeah. 
Are you just saying that because I'm recording? No, 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 no. I like it most when you know that they are poachers, what uh, were busy tracking poachers. Even though you find out that it's hot and you have to walk like a long distance, I mean like kilometers. Yeah, but when you catch, you catch them, yo, that's a relief to us. Yeah. I like that one. And then uh, seeing the wild close by, nature itself. Yeah. yeah. But doesn't it make you sad when you catch the poachers, like a little bit? No, it makes me angry. Yeah, because they are destroying nature. Because in the years to come, some of our kids they will not know how, what, how does the rhino? They will only see they will only see that rhino on the ten rand, like dinosaurs. We just see them on the TV animation. We don't see them anymore. Life, mm-hmm. yeah. But do you do you ever like think about why they're doing it and try to understand maybe from their perspective? They say that horn got money. I'm not sure. I don't know. Oh, it's bad man. It's not good because bad money, that is bad money. Good money is something that you must go and, and I mean like you must go and ask for a job somewhere and then you paid legally, not illegally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what they're doing at first, they don't enter the park with a permission, they trespass. Yeah, find out that they're carrying in illegal hunting rifles. So it's bad money. I think most of uh, black people, they are still disadvantaged even now. Because now I believe like the education first. Black people, they didn't have really that have good education. Even if people try to go to school, they thought like we're not going to go anywhere. They cannot find a job. So what they do, they go for is what? Yes. I believe like colonialism, uh, it just never ended. Maybe if, let's say, that the generation which was colonizing black people was not here, maybe we've got a new generation, maybe it was going to change. But I don't think that their mindset will change overnight, yes. Yes. Yeah, so that kind of links to this idea that people always say that apartheid ended 30 years ago, but you're shaking your head. Talk talk to me about that. the very same reason I'm saying that because those people who were depressing black people, they are still here. Yeah? They have ch- just changed the constitution saying that uh, there is no more apartheid. Then we don't know what they are choking when they are sitting with their children. <laughs> Maybe they are still passing that hatred trade to, those, to their children, yes. Do you feel that hatred in your everyday life from white people? Some of them, not all of them. Some. Yes, they are, I, say, I can say most of them, they are pretending, yes, mm, because they are afraid of the constitution and the law, yes. that's what I believe and think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like in a way, like even this staff village, for example, this is where the staff are, right? But there aren't any white people here. <laughs> you will never find a white person here. <laughs> I don't think they will allow him to go and sleep <laughs> <laughs> no, and then we're afraid to talk about it as well. Mm, maybe if I speak out, I'm going to lose my job, and then yes, nobody's going to support me. So you just keep quiet. Mm. So we don't have a white person who is in a major position or a housekeeper like that. Really? So there's no there's no white rangers. I haven't seen one <laughs> in Los. <laughs> a white field range of Wala Kruger National Park. Yeah. But then how come all the all the section most of the section rangers are white? I don't know. <laughs> yes. But <laughs> we cannot talk about it. They are qualified. So yes. I see. <laughs> I under sorry, I do understand that it's like uncomfortable to talk about because I'm obviously a white person with a recorder 
and I'm like living with your boss so I understand that it's like a strange situation. <laughs> what do you think about where South Africa is at in general? Because yesterday was the day that Nelson Mandela was released from prison, 30 years ago yesterday. You know, people said that it was such an exciting time for the country and everything was changing and it was going to be a country of unification. But a lot of people I've spoken to here, especially black people, have said that they feel that that period is over of reconciliation between the races and that actually racial tensions are strong again. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I will agree. And then again, according to my understanding, when he was released on jail, uh, from jail, they said, like, we are not going to chase away white people. But I think uh, to most of black people, it was painful. But the politician decided, like, uh, to do it like that. But black people, I think they still have got a lot of pain. But I think there's still that tension between white and black. I think black people, they want to retaliate to white people. But since the constitution said we cannot retaliate. Do you think it's possible for, for black and white people in South Africa to actually be integrated? Not really. <laughs> Not really. I think it will be just that hatred from white people like... Um, they are being separated from most of um, the activities of the country. So uh, black people wanted to take all the power while the resources are in the hands of uh, white people. So white pe black people means they are trying to control white people uh, on their resources. Yes. And would you say that this situation with the rhino poaching is kind of symbolic of that? Kruger Park and what's happening here, it's kind of like a symbol of that bigger thing about resources. And if you think about it, like, who benefits from the rhino being alive, really? From a person who is not working here, he can have that uh, mentality. Because I can say now, since I'm working here, I'm benefiting from that rhino. But for a person who is not working here, it will be a different story. They don't think uh, they are benefiting from this right. So killing them and getting money. It's kind of like taking taking something back from the, the white man. Yes, yes. God has blessed white people more than black people. So as more and more African-born scholars like myself are writing our own histories, we have begun to wrestle the problematic interpretations of historical narratives out of those Eurocentric hands. That's Professor Wando Achebe again. And are producing what I call a history of healing in which Africans can not only see themselves in their own histories, but gain a sense of self-worth and pride from those histories. Apartheid, in my mind, was dismantled only on paper, not in reality. Here is a country that now has to re-engineer, in many ways, its, its economy, which during the apartheid period had been dominated by mining. And now they have to re-engineer this economy into more modern areas like tourism and agriculture, while at the same time attempting to overcome this legacy of colonial exploitation, of racial oppression, of global isolation. Because remember, South Africa, the country, was isolated decades of global isolation engendered by these international sanctions that were levied upon this country by others. So today in South Africa, you find a South Africa of astonishing contrast in my mind. You have about 10% of South Africans, the majority of who are white, 
owning more than 90% of the national wealth, whereby 80% of the population who are overwhelmingly Black own nothing at all. And it is this present-day reality which is both the product of apartheid or colonialism, because essentially they're the same thing, apartheid and the crumbling of apartheid, it, it's really only been dismantled on paper. On paper, and people wonder why we haven't gotten our acts together. There's such a thing as neocolonialism in action, and that's what you're seeing all over Africa. There is a precedent of simplistic accounts of the crisis in the Kruger, which depict two groups cleanly divided and positioned in opposition. The reality is a complex and muddled web of value systems, notions of belonging, motivations and desperation. The reality is a mess of conundrums and incongruence. Incongruence within professional teams, within communities, within individual minds. I am no different, influenced by whatever part of the story I've been presented that day. Simplistic accounts of complex things tend to leave out important details, as history has. I'm beginning to wonder who's been left out of the story of this war. Visible Hand was co-created and written by Georgina Savage and Sophie Said in partnership with Case File Presents. It was produced and edited by Georgina Savage, Research and Narration written by Sophie Said, Graphic Design by Marco Vuleta Jukanov, History Segments written by Max Favetti and performed by Seth Kruger. Original score, sound design, and soundtrack by me, Isa Williams. And to play us out, a collaboration with Frank Buyong and Tasneem Williams with a track titled Awe Nawahana. Shall president.